Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Best Practices for Architecting and User Computing Solutions. Today's webinar is brought to you by Nutanix and produced by Actual Tech Media. Before we jump into it, we have just a little bit of housekeeping here that we first need to cover. First off, we want this to be an educational event, not just a sales and marketing event, but a real educational event. And I'm excited to have an expert speaker on today's event who I've known for many years and I know uh, has most likely answers to all of your VDI questions. I don't want to set him up for anything too hard, but uh, rest assured he is an expert in VDI and um, now is a good time to ask questions. So feel free to use the GoToWebinar control panel there uh, in your audience console to ask all of your VDI questions as they come along. We'll be doing a dedicated uh, Q&A session at the end of the event uh, where we'll take all the best questions. So make sure you get those in early. Uh, also, we have a $300 Tango gift card that we'll be announcing at the end of the event today to one lucky prize winner on the live event. If you're watching the event on demand, I'm sorry, the prize drawing has already occurred. Full terms and conditions can be found at events.actualtechmedia.com. And by the way, uh, my name is David Davis, and I'm excited to be your moderator on today's event. Without further delay, let me introduce you to our speaker. That is Mr. Brian Sir. Principal Technical Marketing Engineer at Nutanix. Brian, how you doing? Thanks for being on. Good, thanks for having me, David. It's always good to have you on these events. Just so much knowledge is shared. Uh, and I've seen your deck today and there's some really cool stuff in there. I know the audience is going to enjoy it. So let me transfer control over to you. Looks good, yeah. Take it away. All right. We will uh, talk about best practices for architecting EUC solutions today. You know, mostly focused on the VDI piece of uh, EUC as it goes. Um, but just a bit about myself again. I work in the tech marketing group, uh, which means I cover a number of pieces of the Nutanix stack and then uh, you know EUC as a as a use case that runs on top of us. Uh, most of the content that we'll be discussing today, you know, outside of the Nutanix pieces. Uh, are in the Architecting EUC Solutions book. It was published a couple years ago. The good news is there's another, you know, basically a version two of the book coming out. Uh, expect it kind of, you know, late in the year, and it'll be, uh, you know, released on Nutanix Press, right? So it'll be a, a free item that uh, customers can get uh, from Nutanix. Uh, we'll kind of how the, the content will go today. Uh, we'll kind of weave a little bit about the Nutanix story and along with the best practices story, right? So I'm not going to just Clobby with marketing, like David said, and then uh, you know we'll kind of weave it in and out. So we'll just start a bit here with the with the new tank story. So we've been about about ten years, right? And uh, EUC was really like the first use case that we hung our our hat on, and uh, still remains an important use case. Uh, you know, a good chunk of our business. Um, really, kind of two ways that EUC is deployed on Nutanix. On the left side would be uh, you know traditional EUC, so Citrix and VMware Horizon deployed on the Nutanix HCI platform, right? Where we're performing the compute and storage functions of that stack. And then uh, the other is the desktop as a service. So if you're using Citrix Cloud or Nutanix, it has the Xi frame offering. And both of those can be run in a hybrid fashion where you have the control plane in the cloud, maybe even some worker VMs in the cloud, but then you can also deploy your worker VMs with users uh, using Nutanix infrastructure on-prem uh, on your resources. And then this really comes down to, you know, over the years, you know, we have uh, millions of users deployed on us and, uh, you know, um, thousands of customers uh, running the EUC workload for us. So that's a good foundation uh, to build for your EUC design. These are kind of three pillars uh, that I tend to like to see people focus on. First is understanding your use cases. Right, and use cases really nothing more than a group of users that have similar requirements. This could be like a call center user, you know, could be somebody in accounting, et cetera, right? So you you develop what these different use cases are that you will provide a VDI to, or maybe application presentation, whatever service you're gonna give to them. And then you wanna define the requirements. You also need to know how many users are gonna be in that uh, accessing, and you will care if they are concurrent uh, type of users. Um, for that. So, you know, if you have a thousand users, but you never have more than 500 connecting, then you just really have 500 concurrent sessions that you're going to deal with. And then within the use cases, you may, 
you know, figure out that your organization has 10, 20, 30, 40 use cases. But once you kind of define them uh, and then define the requirements for each, you'll probably find that there's a lot of commonality between several of them, like the call center user and maybe some other type of user are, are essentially exactly the same outside of the applications. And in that case, you can potentially, if, as long as you can find a mechanism to handle how you display the apps to them, they can be collapsed into a single use case because uh, you know, all the rest of the requirements are the same. So it kind of helps you cut a bit of the noise out uh, if you look for those common uh, requirements to, to weed things down. And then requirements, just to give you an idea of, you know, a few things to think about, right? So you're looking at, you know, do they need multiple monitors? Are they going to need to, you know, use USB devices in their virtual sessions? Like, do they need, like, storage keys or signature pads or, you know, things like that. Uh, OS requirements, right? That pretty much everybody's hopefully moved on to Windows 10 if they're uh, doing VDI now. Um, but uh, if you have other OS requirements that you want to know those, you'd want to know about the applications and the usage, um, do they need GPUs, uh, what type of desktops do you think, you know, some use, use cases may be a great fit for non-persistent and others may need a persistent type uh, of desktop uh, to be able to, to, to run in. And then obviously the resource requirements, you know, how much CPU, memory, IO, those type of um, items that they need. And the requirements list is pretty long, right? You kind of flush that out, what makes sense for your organization. And then, uh, you know, basically as you develop the use cases, you just go in and, you know, check out all these boxes and, and figure out what the requirements are. And then on the application side, right, you, you're going to need to understand, like, how many applications are involved. You know, if I've got, you know, one use case, uh, and they only have 20 applications, that's pretty clear, right? But when you have, you know, a bunch of use cases and then you'll have some applications that everybody uses and a bunch of applications that just kind of get used by certain use cases. So you want to identify those out, have them mapped out, um, you know, know, you know, an idea how you would present those applications to your user, whether you're going to present them, you know, via like RDSH, or you're going to use a layering technology, or you're just going to bake them in your images. You know, there's lots of ways that you can accomplish it these days. Um, and that gives you some flexibility in how you can present them, uh, how you want to be able to update them. So based upon those choices, you know, how will you, uh, you know, make, make updates as new versions come out? And then um, I always like to say applications kind of are the, 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 the thing that can really train record deployment by delaying it. So it, it's relatively simple these days to stand up the infrastructure and then spin up some, call them generic Windows 10 virtual desktops on them. You can do that really fast. But when you, you know, have to factor in all your requirements and the applications, you know, if you have potentially hundreds of applications that you need to get ready and package in a layer or build like RDSH farms for that, I find that that can take far longer uh, than just, you know, having the desktop portion to be ready. So really kind of focus on the application side of things and, and understand what your time would be for that. And then, you know, why does some of these uh, matter? Well, they matter for sizing and then also, you know, so you can select the right product and, and provide the right service. So when it comes to sizing, uh, you want to collect data. And if you're coming from physical world into the virtual world, then you should collect it from your you know, existing physical uh, endpoints today. So if they're, you know, full-blown Windows v PCs, then you should be collecting data from them for your different use cases. And if you've got, you know, four or five different use cases, you want to collect data from each of them. And that's also how you're going to learn about the application. So if you use the, the tools like from Liquidware, Lakeside, um, they'll actually give you application lists and tell you about their usage and everything as part of that. They're also going to give you all the, the resource usages how much memory, how much CPU, et cetera, disk, you know, all that type of stuff. The, when it comes to CPU, it, don't get too hung up over like the whole CPU ratio. Ideally, what you want to know is you want to know how much CPU and megahertz each user is using, because you'll use that um, basically as your, your commitment on what you'll be able to need to size. So if every user needs a, you know, a gigahertz, then when I size, I need to make sure that, you know, I'm going to put, you know, 75 users on a host each of those 75 users need access to that one gigahertz all the time. And then it can build in some uh, slot space for, um, you know, for peaks and things like that. And also you're going to want to know, like, uh, are they running Windows 7 versus Windows 10? I won't talk a lot about that in this webinar because, you know, we're getting to the end of Windows 7 here. But there is a, 
uh, in an increase in CPU usage between those Windows versions and also Office versions, right? So if you're on Windows 7, an older version of Office on your physical endpoints, but you're moving to Windows 10 in a newer modern Office version in the virtual world, then they will consume more resources than what you collected as part of that. You'll also potentially be affected by the security patches like Spectre and Meltdown, uh, you know, and things like that. And even like display protocol choices between the vendors uh, has effect uh, on the sizing and, and density. So there's lots of things to figure out in there, um, but uh, good news is there's tools and lots of information out there to help with that. So um, now we'll get a, our first piece on the tanks view. So uh, we've got a you know excellent choice for building EUC solutions uh, with new tanks here, right? So the platform you know is hyper converged, uh, so very simple to deploy, manage, uh, and operate. It also provides you a, a great bit of flexibility, right? So we we support three hypervisors and see them listed on the left. So it gives you a choice, uh, you know, in the hypervisor selection there for that. And also we have obviously a, a wide choice uh, at the hardware option. You know, we have our Nutanix branded appliances. We've got OEM agreements with HPE, with Dell, with Lenovo, et cetera. And then also a lot of uh, software um, support options on the other major server vendors. So it gives you that flexibility. And then when it comes to BDI broker, uh, obviously you can do Citrix, which will use any of the three hypervisors that we support. Uh, if you want to do frame, it supports the all the public cloud vendors and it supports our Acropolis hypervisor on-prem. And we've got Microsoft and obviously you can do VMware Horizon on us, which is a popular choice. And the good news is there's no restriction on the type of provisioning, right? So all the provisioning options that each of the vendor option uh, provide can be uh, you know, done in the tanks platform. So uh, you're free to choose whichever mechanism uh, makes the most sense for your design there. And uh, just kind of wrap this section up then form factor, right? So again, we mentioned we do appliances and software we have all the different server vendors, um, really just kind of focus on the configuration, right? So you have the freedom to mix CPU generations, mix different memory config and CPU core counts, whatever makes sense for your environment. Or if you started a cluster and you're on like Broadwell and now you want to expand and go to Cascade Lake, right? You're, you're free to do that in a, in a single cluster there. All right, next up, we'll, we'll talk a bit about Windows 10, uh, because if you haven't already gone there, then you're going to need to go there very soon. So Windows 10 is a bit of a different beast. It, it's more of a, call it a living operating system, um, where basically twice a year, they're releasing a, a, essentially a new version of the operating system. They call them different builds uh, as part of it, but they're really more like a different operating system than they are like an old service pack and, and what you used to get in Windows. And as part of that, there is actually some bumps along the road, right? They certainly have consumed different amounts of resources in the different builds that we're gonna talk about. They can, form dent, uh, they can affect your user density. And also they've uh, affected things like, you know, how the, um, like a profile tool works with the, uh, with the start menu and things like that, right? So moving to the different builds are actually a bit more disruptive uh, than what an old service pack is. So you'd wanna, you know, spend your due diligence when you're moving from one to the other and really test all your apps, test all the tools you work with. You know, it's a bit more of a heavy lift um, jumping between the, the versions than uh, previous. And then uh, this is a bit um, from some internal testing that we we did. We use log and BSI for the testing. Essentially, the, you know, across the bottom, you see the different Windows 10 versions. And uh, basically, it's the impact on density. So the number of users that I can get, um, you know, on a node safely with uh, before I run out of CPU, essentially. And uh, basically, the difference is, as you see, the newer versions, I'm getting less users per node. It's because the operating system had changes in it and uh, is using more resources, which ultimately I get you know, less users per node. Uh, not, this data is not specific to Nutanix, right? It's gonna do this uh, on any compute platform as part of that. But just give you an idea that, uh, you know, simply moving between the Windows 10 version, um, it actually uses more resources, which is probably a surprise to, to most, I would think. So next up, uh, Focused on optimizing your, your OS image, always been important, but for Windows 10, it's probably even a little more important because it's, um, you know, again, a bit of a different operating system. 
as part of that, right? So you obviously want to disable a lot of services. You know, there's Xbox stuff and there's Hyper-V stuff in there. If you're not using Windows Defender, if you got your own, uh, you know, um, security software, then you want to disable that. There's a lot of scheduled tasks in there. If you're not using OneDrive, you should remove that. You know, there's quite a bit of information in there. Uh, you know, th there's default profiles you can potentially do if you're doing non-persistent, depending on what your which profile tool you're using. Uh, you can get rid of the Windows Update service, uh, remove the Windows Store uh, apps. You know, those those baked in apps uh, traditionally are not used, so get rid of those. And then, uh, you know, if you're not going to use GPU, which the vast majority of people are, are not buying GPU still for Windows 10, it is growing, but uh, still a minority. Then you can disable the, the GPU acceleration uh, as a policy. And then uh, if you can automate the build, uh, that's a, a big plus, right? Uh, use the, the Microsoft deployment uh, tools to be able to automate, automize it. And then anytime you make a new build or even update your images, you need to recheck the optimization. So, you know, simply applying some patches or upgrading a, you know, like a new version of Acrobat or some piece of software can undo different pieces of your optimization. So you would actually want to rerun your optimizations each time uh, you do any updates to your image. So it's more of an ongoing life cycle to keep you going. And the optimizations actually have, um, you know, a pretty big effect, right? So um, if you're doing Horizon, uh, they don't, you know, like auto optimize every, anything by default. Citrix, when you install the, you know, the agent, actually has a checkbox, you know, and says you can optimize it. And this does have some benefit, but it doesn't get you all the way there. So you can see from the chart on the on the left, right? Um, if you if you did optimize, you know, with the Citrix uh, option when you did the agent, it will get you part way there. Is you know, basically essentially sixty percent of the way there. So it's not bad. It's better than nothing. But if you do that and then fully optimize with one of the tools that we uh, we'll talk about next, you know, then you're essentially getting forty percent more user density, which is you know a pretty big effect between the uh, between the two, right? So it's it's worth doing all this difference is it could be the difference of you getting, you know, say 50, 60 users per node uh, versus, you know, upwards of 100 users per node if you're fully optimized, right? It all, all ultimately depends on your users and which apps and what they're doing in there. But, uh, you know, just from testing that we've done and we've seen others do, it can make, uh, you know, upwards of a 50% difference uh, between being optimized and not optimized. It's a very important task to do. And then just, uh, you know, some guides on how to do it. So, um, you know, both VMware and Citrix have guides uh, published about optimizing. And then there are tools out there. So Citrix has the optimizer. It's just a nice little tool you install on your agent. And then you run it. It has profiles uh, both from Citrix and from the community that you can use. And then obviously you can clone those and, and make your own tweaks and, and get it to, um, to where you like it. And the VMware OS optimization is same, essentially the same thing, right? There's a bunch of built-in templates. You can clone those or make your own and make the changes to them, which I highly suggest because um, taking some of the out-of-box ones can sometimes be a little too aggressive um, for that. So you need to essentially start with one, uh, apply it to your image, and then do your user testing and see if it breaks anything. If it breaks anything, then you figure out what it broke, go unoptimize that piece, and then you get it tuned so it works to your environment, and then you save it as a template. And that way, uh, in, anytime you have to re-optimize it, it's just ready to go as your own template. And then there's an open uh, source tool called BPA out there. You see the web link, um, which is kind of a little bit simpler version of those, but it gets the job done. And then there's a script from Microsoft uh, that's out there for, um, for optimizing uh, 1803 also. Next up, uh, back to this Nutanix topic. So a, a big differentiator we have from a storage side is that our, our HCI platform uses locality in there. Essentially, we want the reads to come from the local node. So what this means in for VDI is, uh, you know, if we have a couple thousand users on a cluster in a non-persistent use case like uh, linked clones or instant clones for Horizon or MCS on the Citrix side as an example, you're going to have your, your gold image, your replica VM, depending on the, the vendor you, you use. And from there, I'm going to create my 2,000 users. And when all those VMs get created, all those reads are going to come from that uh, single gold image, that VDisk. 
Well, the good news is on Nutanix, we're going to auto sense this and we're going to create a copy of that called a shadow clone on every node in the cluster, allowing those VMs on each node just to read from the local flash, giving them, you know, that good, consistent user experience. So this does several things. It gives you a consistent user experience no matter the size of the cluster. So whether I'm three nodes or 20, 30 nodes, et cetera, they get the same user experience uh, as you scale the number of users in there. It also keeps all the reads off of the network because it's reading them locally and it doesn't have to take that extra latency for, for going across the network. And the good news if you use something like app volumes where your app layers are just another VDisk, they also get the benefit from the, the shadow clone uh, experience also and get that, that good experience, right? So the locality is gonna help you uh, anytime uh, the system or the user reads from this image. So boot storms, login storms, when they launch the applications, all those are read activities and they can happen in mass from you know hundreds or thousands of users in the same cluster. So these are all gonna come locally off a node uh, and get much better performance for that. And then just some uh, kind of couple proof points to back that up. So we did some testing with, with deploying link clones. Essentially, you know, 400 users on four nodes, 600 users on six nodes, and then 800, 800 users on eight nodes. And you can see the blue line is when we use shadow clones with locality. The line is basically flat, barely changed uh, the amount of time it took to deploy, you know, the number of desktops. But you can see the top line is when we manually turned off shadow clones. You can see that the, um, you know, time it takes to provision the number of desktops uh, is basically an increasing amount as you increase. So that, that would essentially be how other, uh, you know, competitive products are going to see a similar feature, right? Without the benefits of locality, they're going to see it take longer the larger number, the group of numbers, the larger the group of users that you're trying to provision. And kind of last uh, proof point for this is we did a, a similar test where we were testing with login VSI for Citrix users. Uh, running on Nutanix. And we did it with uh, 150 users per node. And then we started with a single node, we went to two nodes, then four nodes, six, and up, out to eight nodes. And essentially what this show is linear scaling of users by adding nodes. And then also the, the line at the top is the login VSI metric for response time. That's basically the response time of, of uh, the application response what the user would see. So we can see that we linearly scaled users on the nodes. And then also our response time at the top is uh, you know, nearly flat, right? So if we look at one node with 150 users, response time at 1247, and then ultimately at the end with 1200 users and eight nodes, that response time is just three points difference to 1250. So that's pretty remarkable and shows that uh, that lo locality really is the key for that linear scaling of, of the user experience. All right, next up, um, just kind of wrap this up, right? It's just basically a visual of the same thing. Uh, you know, you stack our nodes and, and build out and scale out. Um, you're gonna kind of hear the you know same thing from any hyperconverged vendor, right? And it's, and it's true, right? They, if you add a node, it gives them some compute and storage, but the difference is that it won't linearly scale uh, the user experience because uh, without locality, uh, the more users they stack in, they're just gonna keep putting more users on that single image for them whereas we get the, the data locally from each node. All right, so next, uh, back to the design piece. So we're talking about uh, cluster, uh, you know, basically how large should I design my cluster? It's a pretty common question. Um, so really it comes down to requirements, right? And then uh, it's kind of a, a, basically a balance between reducing the number of clusters you'd wanna manage, but you also wanna have failure domains. And a good example of this is, um, let's say I've got, you know, say 3,000 users and I could, you know, fit those 3,000 users as long as it doesn't go past the, you know, if I'm using VMware as an example, as long as it doesn't go past their hypervisor limit for the number of nodes you can get in the cluster, you can do that. But if I just have a single uh, cluster with all my users in, it means I only have a single failure domain from a hypervisor standpoint. So, um, that's not ideal, right? Because if I'd have like a bad ESXi upgrade, it would affect uh, my entire cluster and ultimately all my users. So in that case, having at least two failure domains, so just splitting that, uh, you know, that design into two clusters with 1500 users each, that gives me, uh, you know, separate failure domains. So I could upgrade one cluster 
uh, at a time. And if I had that like, uh, you know, upgrade failure, you know, bad patch or whatever, then I'm never affecting my entire user base. So that's kind of the failure domain side of things to look at. And then uh, how big your failure domain will ultimately really kind of comes down to, um, you know, how large your ultimately your environment is, right? If I've got 100,000 users, I'm probably going to have, um, you know, larger failure domains than I would if I've got, you know, say five, 6,000 users where I might want, you know, a thousand or two, th you thousand or fifteen hundred users in each cluster, whatever. I kind of figure out that that would be, and also um, other things like uh, you know sizing impact that comes from use cases. Uh, you know, how much CPU um, are the users using GPUs, which can uh, affect your density quite well, right? So you may find like uh, if you use GPUs, I can't get a you know say maybe sixty to eighty users per node. It's kind of artificially limited because of the number of GPUs that I can get in there. And, um, you know, then you kind of ratchet that out and I want to put two or 3000 users in there, then I could, because of the low density, I could like be bumping up against potentially some limit depending on, upon the hypervisor that you choose. And then there's other kind of recommendations. Um, there's been a long standing recommendation from, from VMware that 2000 users inside of a vCenter um, is a good point to kind of cut it off, right? So um basically whatever cluster size that ultimately ends um you know that i kind of limit to 2000 there is a new qa limit that says 4000 but uh, if you still look at the reference architectures and talk to other architects the 2000 is still probably the most widely uh known there and then kind of the other piece is um maintenance windows right so how long is it going to take me to patch a hypervisor in a cluster um you know run nutanix there's the the you know, the Nutanix uh, software upgrade, which is called AOS, gives me all the control and data plane upgrades, right? So, so each of those have a timing. Uh, I, I tend to like to use the hypervisor option because it takes about roughly 15 minutes to patch a host. Um, it's done non-disruptively, so there's no outage to, uh, to your VMs, but it still takes time, right? And as part of you uh, planning for your cluster size, I've, I've kind of given some examples, right? So 15 minutes per node, a 16 node cluster is going to take about four hours, you know, plus or minus a little bit to patch, whereas a 32 node is going to patch for eight hours. So um, if, if you don't get very long patching windows uh, or you can't get them very often, then it might be, you know, in your best interest to have a smaller uh, node cluster. But, you know, those type of things will be um, what you think about. And then also if you're going to upgrade multiple pieces of software within a single window, uh, that can affect you know, your, your time also, right? So if you want to do like a full stack upgrade, the hypervisor, the AOS level, et cetera, then you've got to, you know, plan for each of those and that can affect your cluster size. So take a look about like how that would scale, right? So we talked about uh, building blocks. So block and pod is, is kind of a, the most popular architecture. I'm going to give this example for Horizon, but it's uh, nearly identical if you're, uh, if you're doing it for Citrix also, right? So a Horizon pod can be up to 10,000 users, and I'm going to have some building blocks below that. Our building blocks in here are going to be an example of a, a vCenter with uh, 2,000 users in there. So I just scale this out until I get five building blocks. That gives me 10,000 users. So now when I want to do my next increment, I add another Horizon, excuse me, another Horizon pod, and then I can add essentially five more building blocks. So now I'm up to 20,000 users. And if, to get me the rest of the way, I add a third horizon block, and those are all unified together, uh, you know, in the cloud pod typically. And I can add my remaining building blocks. So it's just a, a pattern that I rinse and repeat, and I can ultimately scale this as, as big as I want um, to get the number of users for that. For Citrix, the bottom piece, the, the building blocks would be exactly the same. Just your control plane layer, uh, you'd scale that uh, in the fashion that Citrix uh, would recommend, which is a different concept than Horizon has for the pods, but uh, uh, basically the same approach. All right, next back to talk a little bit about Nutanix. So we have Nutanix Files, which is a, a software uh, file services option that can be deployed on any cluster. It can be deployed on the same cluster that you're running your workloads, or if you had a larger environment wanted to build a dedicated cluster to just run your file services, you could do that. Nice thing is it's a software offering. Uh, to be able to provide SMB shares. It just spins up controllers and it's scalable in terms of storage and the number of connections. So it, essentially you tell it how much storage you want 
and the number of user connections, and it will provision enough resources to um, to handle those connections. And this is great for you know storing your user profile data, your user files, um, maybe in some uh, application layers, depending on the product if they use an SMB share, um, are all great uh, options to be able to do this. And then it's uh, very easy to deploy. It's a couple of questions that you ask, uh, answer. You give it some AD credentials, and then it joins everything, and you've got a share, and it's ready to go. And and uh, your UC team can manage this rather than having to, to have the storage team uh, basically provide the service as a separate silo for you. So it's great for you know eliminating the extra silos in your support organization if it makes sense. It's uh, very simple. It manages in Prism just like everything else. Um, for Nutanix, it integrates with AD, so you can use uh, you know shares and quotas. It's got previous version support. We've got a number number of integrations with antivirus and uh, backup companies, and provide all the, the features that you want. And then you can obviously um, you know uh, it's got built-in HA, but you can use our um, storage replication to to replicate it between, replicate it between sites for uh, you know business continuity and, and disaster. And then it's got all the space saving features built in, so that you can uh, Save uh, space. Next up is a bit about the um, the security patches. So you know, Spectra meltdown and the foreshadowing patch. Um, there's even some newer ones here that uh, we're not going to talk about, but they've been kind of the um, you know the bane for a lot of people uh, when it comes to Windows 10 because it's been eating up more resources. And, and Windows 10 already kind of had a heavy uplift, uh, but then when you stacked uh, these extra security patches on there, it, it got worse. So essentially um, we did the same testing as we talked about before. On the left is with Spectrum Meltdown disabled. That gave us our baseline. And then if you enable Spectrum Meltdown in Windows 10 there and, and protect it, uh, basically it's about a 7% drop in density. And then we see a further drop in um, density when you go to uh, the, the L1TF, the foreshadowing, uh, uh, exploit and the big difference is there basically to fix that is you're turning off hyper threading um, so that's that's why the, the much larger drop in density there and ultimately you know with the with these changes there's some effect in user experience i didn't provide those charts because it probably wouldn't have enough time to talk about them but so next up is um basically how the density and performance is kind of affected across the last um three generations of Intel CPUs, right? So the G5, the G6, G7 are the, um, G7 is the current, so it'd be Cascade Lake, G6 would be Broadwell, and G5 is, I forget my Intel names now, the Ivy Bridge, whatever came before Broadwell, uh, essentially the baseline. So we can see with each generation, you know, we're getting more users uh, per core, essentially, you know, we're getting better density, so more powerful CPUs. And then the you know the red line is basically our response time, you know how fast those applications, right? So we're getting the benefit of more density, but also faster response time. You can see across the generations um, as we as we track them. So the good news is that while Windows 10 and these patches are eating up more resources, if you're on or moving to modern hardware, then uh, they're going to help uh, you know absorb that. So you kind of in that sense you're you're staying level <laughs> you know you're not improving your density you're not really getting worse it, it's basically uh hopefully it's being fairly uh, offset by the by the improvements in the newer cpus and last up on the um <clears throat> on the tank side is is just talking about the securing side so obviously you know there's a lot of security discussions when it comes to vdi but uh, on the network side, um, traditionally, you know, there's some type of network security, usually firewalls. So the, the, the traditional approach to this would be to use physical firewalls, right? So I could use VLANs to segment off uh, desktops from each other, and I could, you know, not allow the traffic to be routed between VLANs, or I could send all that traffic through a firewall and, you know, apply rules and, and be able to do that. So that's all possible if you have that uh, capabilities in your environment. But it's a bit of a heavy uplift, and then it's certainly as a dynamic as uh, VDI is, uh, you're, you know, can be a lot of changes in operation between the teams and, and do that. And it's also hard to, you know, secure between VMs uh, on the same subnet as an example. So a good answer to this is, um, you know, certainly uh, if you're running the VMware stack, you got NSX. 
if you're running uh, our Acropolis hypervisor AHV, then we have a product called Nutanix Flow that allows you to do uh, per VM based firewall. So we can see uh, as an example here, we've got a number of desktop pools and the, the one on the, you know, the, the top three in this example, I can apply rules and the lines, you know, to show you the, the, the red cross, you know, that no traffic is being allowed to pass even between the VMs within the pool. So I'm stopping, you know, inter VM traffic between them. So if my users don't have a need to talk, then I can prevent that. And that's great for, you know, stopping exploits and allowing things to spread between, you know, different VMs as part of that. We, we'd like to stop that, uh, you know, helps with security. And then the, the bottom one example is if I have a need in that uh, engineering department for the VMs to talk, then I can allow them to do that. So through some simple policies done in PRISM, I can create security policies for a group of VMs and just assign it to them with a tag and control like uh, precisely what goes in and out based upon the protocol and ports and uh, whether they are allowed to talk to each other. So it's very simple to set up and uh, maintain. And uh, it, it goes with the VM, right? So uh, Flow doesn't care about the IP address because it's assigned to the VM and, and the rules that you apply to. So it gives you that uh, easy fine grain uh, control. It's just a uh, feature inside a prism that gets unlocked. So there's not a separate product that you need to uh, deploy, upgrade and manage. You just uh, use it as a feature inside of uh, prism. So there's nothing additional there to deal with or, or design as part of it other than rules that you're going to deploy. And this works uh, for HV hypervisor. So if you are running Citrix on HV or Nutanix um, frame on HV um, and certainly other workloads, as long as they run an HV as a hypervisor, then you, you can take advantage of this. And I think that is my last slide, David. So um, I'm gonna open back up and we can um, you know, start taking some questions. Yeah, Brian, great presentation. Uh, we do have some questions here that came in for you while you were presenting. Yeah. Uh, the first one, uh, George is asking, uh, should personal USB devices be allowed to connect at all? Like, what have you seen out in the real world? So, I mean, should they? That all depends on the, the security stance of what your organization needs to do, right? So there's certainly a number of use cases where people will use these um, uh, different, like, agencies, healthcare, things like that, where they have... Um, you know, people do like dictation and they have like a foot pedal, like if you go to the hospital and they have those signature pads, you know, those are very common things where, um, you know, they need USB devices. And I'm sure there's other examples in there. But if you don't have those type of things, then, yeah, it, it may make perfectly sense to, to lock those down and prevent people from, um, you know, doing that. And so that, that's kind of where I would just revert it back to, you know. Uh, focus on your requirements. You know, if they don't need those, if they don't have a requirement for those, then you shouldn't leave it open for them. Okay. Okay. Another question here they're asking uh, about Windows Defender. I think you recommended to uh, disable Windows Defender. They're saying, you know, what what would you recommend then that we do for um, antivirus, you know, and malware defense if we disable Windows Defender? Well, so so I guess... If you already, most organizations that I've dealt with in my consulting days or, you know, even today, typically they own some antivirus product, whether it be Semantic or McAfee or Trend or something. And then they're going to, if they use that in the physical world, they are likely going to use it in the virtual world. So in that case, they would disable Defender. But if you don't own any security software like that, then uh, then you could use Windows Defender because something is, is better than nothing. And, and Defender has gotten better, so. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, another question here. A uh, couple of questions actually that came in about uh, can they get the presentation for download? Um, I wanted to point out that the landing page for the event will be turned into a an on-demand uh, recording of the event. So feel free to go back and you know watch the recording of the event at any time. Um, but I don't believe we have plans to send out the deck right now. Um, another question: Is there any sort of uh, calculator or sizer? to help us kind of determine, you know, how big of a cluster should we build? Yeah, so um, so Nutanix has a tool called Nutanix Sizer. Um, it uh, is obviously available to Nutanix employees, all the partners, and it has limited access, I think, to customers today. So I think customers just have to request access to it. But what Sizer does is allow you to input 
uh, the requirements of your uh, use cases, you know, and, and VDI is a use case, uh, RDSH is a use case, you know, SQL, Server, Splunk, a whole bunch of ones, and then just generic virtualization. And it'll take those requirements and it'll then make recommendations for you. And then you can, you know, if you're well-educated in sizing how it works and then it, in the detailing platform, then you can, you know, go into manual override node. And then if you want to change like cluster size, add, remove nodes, change the configuration, right? You can all play with that. And then it gives you basically gauges that tell you like how much CPU, memory, storage, et cetera, all the different like uh, resources within a cluster and on how utilized they are and whether they're N plus one and plus two, right? So you've got all that feedback to know that if you make a change uh, that you haven't violated some like design construct that, uh, you know, will bite you. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Another question is about, um, can you run VDI and other tier one workloads on the same Nutanix cluster without performance problems? Yeah, absolutely. So it all comes down to um, just understanding your requirements well. And that's really from the kind of the compute memory standpoint. And uh, as long as you size based upon real requirements and that actually what gets deployed, then yeah, there's no no harm in mixing them. I would say generally people only mix them, you know, kind of on the smaller scale, right? You know, if I have 2000 VDI users, uh, it's going to be a decent sized cluster. It just makes sense to dedicate that, right? But if I've got like, you know, 100 or 200 VDI users, and then I've got some other workloads, and uh, you know that's going to be like a six or eight node cluster. Then it maybe makes much more sense to, at that scale to to mix them. It's all kind of a decision upon um, at what scale you're at. Okay. Okay. Good. It's good to have that flex uh, flexibility. Another question: uh, What's the most constrained resource in most VDI clusters? Yeah, with the with the Windows 10 one, it usually is CPU these days. But if you have a GPU requirement, then GPU uh, typically becomes the most constraining aspect um, because uh, you can only fit so many of the NVIDIA cards in to different servers. You know, some servers will take as few as one, and some of the new ones now and the NVIDIA cards got smaller that maybe you can get four or five or six of them in a, in a one in a card or in a server. But then it all depends on the size of the card, right? You know, if each card only takes like 16 users and I can fit, you know, four of them in there, then that means I get what, like 64 users on a node, which is probably less than I could get in there if I took away the, the GPU requirements. So typically it's CPU and then and then if you use GPU, that's the most constraining piece. Okay. All right. Um, what about uh, running virtual desktops in the cloud or doing some sort of hybrid uh, configuration? Is that possible with Nutanix? Yeah, absolutely. There's a number of ways you can do it. So, um, you know, got a strong partnership with Citrix and uh, Citrix Cloud allows you to, to run workloads, you know, in public clouds and obviously on-prem, you could do it on Nutanix. And then uh, our Nutanix frame uh, offers similar capabilities, right? So frame supports, you know, I think all the major public clouds that is AWS, Google, and Azure. And then you can run them on-prem on HV uh, on us. So it gives you the, the hybrid option and give you that flexibility to run workloads where you need. So maybe you run your, your long-term consistent workloads on-prem, but if you've got like a couple of short-term or bursting use cases, or, or maybe you want to locate the desktops next to uh, somebody that's in a faraway region, then uh, public cloud could be a great option for those. Okay, okay, yeah, great. Again, it's good to have a lot of different flexibility. Um, and then I'll just ask this question, and that is what's the easiest way to get started with Nutanix and VDI? For somebody who's interested, maybe they're not doing VDI today, maybe they're not doing Nutanix even, you know, what do you recommend? Yeah, so you can just go to Nutanix.com slash VDI is a great place to start. And then um, I'd say within your local regions, the uh, the local teams do a lot of boot camps and like events, and they're great places to get some hands-on experience with Nutanix and then, you know, talk to people that are, you know, well-educated and there's typically other customers there you can hear from. So it's uh, like great events. Okay, okay, excellent, excellent. Well, I think we've answered all the questions and uh, it's a really great presentation. Brian, thank you so much for being on the event today. I appreciate it, David. Thanks for uh, hosting this for us. Yeah, always good to have you. Always good info. Uh, before we go, I want to announce our winner of the $300 Tango gift card 
That's going out to Roger Demari or Demari from Texas. Congratulations, Roger from Texas. And thank you everyone who joined us on the event today. Uh, if you weren't a winner, uh, better luck or best luck, best of luck next time. Uh, for more events, check out events.actualtechmedia.com. And finally, I want to thank Nutanix for sponsoring today's event. Uh, like Brian said, uh, visit Nutanix.com slash VDI for more information. And of course, local representatives, local boot camps. I also pasted the link to Nutanix.com slash VDI in the audience chat right there in your go to webinar console if you want to click on that. I also pasted some of the links that Brian referenced in his presentation in that chat. So feel free to check those out. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on the event today. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a great day. See you next time.